Hey, this is Chris Reeder with another presentation. Uh, again, I'm the laboratory supervisor over at the Gainesville Immunohematology Reference Lab. Uh, so this, this presentation focuses on perinatal issues in transfusion medicine. This topic is heavily cited on that ASCP board exam that you'll be taking. Um, and in hospital laboratories that handle these issues, uh, it provides a lot of work for those techs. Um, we'll see some of it on our end here in the IRL, uh, but it's generally after the initial testing has already taken place, af after the, the hospital facility has, has finished the preliminary testing. These are our objectives for this module. Uh, most importantly, um, you're going to learn what HDFN is and the role of the medical technologist in diagnosing and managing HDFN. And then we're going to go over the similarities and differences between ABO HDFN and RHD HDFN. Uh, although there are other antigens that can stimulate um, HDFN. Uh, related to RH, HDFN is administration of RH immune globulin. We're going to go over the indications for that, as well as tests for detecting and quantifying fetal maternal hemorrhage to determine the appropriate dosage for RH immune globulin. And then after that, we're going to start talking about neonatal exchange transfusion and what types of blood products we're going to need in terms of blood groups and uh, special characteristics. At its core, HDFN is pretty simple to understand. Uh, you've got uh, the mother who is previously exposed to a red blood cell antigen, either by transfusion or pregnancy. Uh, uh, she now has a, a baby um, inside of her that, that expresses that antigen. Um, so ma maternal IgG antibodies can freely cross the placenta by active transport in the second trimester, uh, which is usually great because it provides passive immunity to the fetus against um, bacteria, viruses, and, and fungi. But um, when those antibodies target antigens on the fetus's red cells, uh, they're, they're in for a bad time uh, because the, the fetal monocyte macrophage system kind of lyses those cells, uh, resulting in either anemia during pregnancy uh, or an accumulation of bilirubin, specifically unconjugated bilirubin, after delivery. The rate of destruction depends on the titer or the strength of the antibody and the specificity of the antibody, uh, because that determines how many binding sites are available on the red cells. Uh, babies are not completely helpless against red cell destruction. Like normal humans, they, they have uh, compensatory mechanisms. Uh, specifically, they, um, they have extramedullary hematopoiesis, or, or the formation of red blood cells outside of the bone marrow. Um, neonatal tissues are great at this, um, but then they kind of slack off in their other duties uh, when they're uh, relegated to making blood. The more hematopoiesis these tissues perform, uh, the more they swell, and that leads to um, predominantly hepatosplenomegaly, um, and that uh, leads to hypertension and damage to the liver cells. So hepatosplenomegaly, if I can say it correctly, uh, that's, that's uh, um, enlargement of the liver and the spleen, which are two sites of um, extramedullary hematopoiesis. Uh, we also see the release of immature red blood cells into circulation, and, and that is called erythroblastosis fatalis. A severe anemia uh, can lead to cardiac failure and generalized edema or effusions, um, and this is known as hydrops fatalis. Uh, when the liver is overwhelmed by hematopoiesis and does not produce enough plasma proteins to retain, osmotic, to re retain the osmotic pressure, um, and then finally, we have to deal with the degradation products of hemolysis. Uh, primarily, we're concerned about unconjugated bilirubin. Now, in utero, any unconjugated bilirubin can easily be transported across the placenta and then be conjugated by the mother's fully developed liver. But after delivery, um, especially if it's, a, if it's premature delivery, uh, the neonate's not so lucky because its liver just can't handle that much bilirubin. Um, after moderate or severe HDFN, serum levels of unconjugated bilirubin reach a point of toxicity uh, and accumulate in the baby's brain, um, and that leads to permanent brain damage. Um, this phenomenon is known as carnicterus. HDFN, due to ABO and RH serological um, differences, uh, kind of have the same etiology, but just differing results. Um, since people naturally make anti-A, anti-B, or anti-A comma B, uh, they already have antibodies which could potentially cross the placenta and cause HDFN. 
Uh, however, since carbohydrate antigens are usually poorly expressed and most ABO antibodies are IgM anyway, um, therefore unable to cross placenta, uh, ABO HDFN tends to be much milder than RH HDFN. Uh, this type of HDFN can be treated with photo phototherapy after delivery, uh, which helps conjugate the unconjugated bilirubin. Uh, conversely, RHD antibodies are only made after exposure to the antigen. So this usually happens in the second pregnancy of an RHD negative mother. RH HDFN tends to be very severe, uh, but fortunately it's, it's preventable it's preventable by injecting the patient with, uh, with RH immune globulin, which we'll, we'll get to later. Um, severe anemia due to RHD, um, HDFN uh, can be treated with intrauterine or uh, exchange transfusion after delivery. In the first trimester, mothers will often be asked about previous pregnancies and any complications which may be related to antibody production. Uh, a type and screen is then performed. Uh, and if the antibody screen is positive, then the antibody or antibodies uh, must be identified. Once identified, a titration um, is usually performed to assess the risk of severe HDFN um, if the fetus happens to be expressing the, the corresponding antigen. Uh, so, so generally, a titration is only useful for the first affected pregnancy. Um, the value assigned to a critical titer is often determined by the testing facility um, and it may differ based on the antibody specificity. So uh, in most cases, a titer of 16 is considered to be critical and warrants repeat testing at about 18 to 20 weeks gestation. A fourfold increase or, or two tubes um, in, a, in a serial dilution indicates that um, exposure to the corresponding antigen has occurred. Uh, so then you might want to use something like Doppler imaging of the uh, the median cerebral artery uh, to determine peak systolic velocity, uh, and that'll help assess the neonate for hemolysis. Uh, this would not be done by medical technologists, that's on the, the physician's end. Um, they'll order the, the imaging tests. Uh, the fetus can be assessed for expression of the antigen by testing the father, if, if they know who the father is, uh, with a serological phenotype or by performing a predictive molecular genotype. Um, this was once more com uh, commonly employed to determine uh, RHD status. Uh, it might be become popular again um, just to limit the usage of um, RH amine globulin. Neonatal testing is performed on blood collected from the umbilical cord after delivery. Um, I've seen a couple different collection techniques. Uh, the, the more primitive technique of basically squeezing out the blood from the umbilical cord into an EDA tube um, and then also a non-additive tube um, it's, that's, that's one way of going about it. Uh, and then the more conventional technique of using a syringe to draw blood directly from the umbilical vein after separation, uh, and then attaching a vacutainer tube uh, to the syringe in order to uh, place it into your tubes. Uh, so that, that first method that I mentioned uh, usually results in a, a lot of clots, uh, and those need to be removed with, um, uh, with wooden applicator sticks before any testing can be performed. Uh, it's also worthwhile to wash your red cell suspension oh, like four to eight times uh, prior to testing just to make sure you remove any of that. Um, there's this viscous substance called Wharton's jelly that can uh, interfere with your testing. You want to make sure that that's not present. Cord blood testing involves um, first a, a forward ABORH, like what you do for confirming uh, donor units, and then a DAT, um, but you want to use anti-IgG only. You're not going to use anti-C3 um, because remember anti-C3 is a pseudomarker for IgM binding. Uh, and we're not worried about IgM binding because IgM cannot cross the placenta. So only um, a DAT using only anti-IgG. Um, because neonates do not have well-developed immune systems, uh, they don't, and they don't really produce enough anti-A or anti-B to warrant um, performing a, uh, a reverse type. Um, I, there's not much plasma in cord blood anyway, um, so that, these are the reasons that we really just perform a, a forward ABORH. Now, if the DAT is positive, um, we typically need to perform an elution to verify which antibody is binding to the neonatal red blood cells. This can be done a couple different ways. Um, so first, if, if a mother has a negative antibody screen, 
um, but we notice an ABO serological incompatibility between the mother and the neonate, uh, such as if, if the mother is group O and the, and the baby is group A, the, the mother might be producing some anti-A or anti-B or anti-A comma B that crosses the placenta that could bind to the neonate's um, A cells. Um, then we would employ what's called a Louis freeze thaw uh, illusion. Um, that's, that's the most efficient means of verifying it. Um, although most facilities out there right now, rather than performing this, just kind of assume that since the screen's negative and there's an ABO serological incompatibility, that uh, it's, it's, it's that incompatibility that's causing the DAT, uh, the positive DAT. Um, so a Louis freeze thaw illusion, it's, it's exactly what it sounds like. You freeze a suspension of the neonatal red blood cells um, and then you thaw them under running water so that all of the RBCs lice, and this leaves behind only an eluate of un unbound antibody. It looks like a hemolysis, like it's, it's just a clear red liquid. It almost looks exactly like the cells did originally, just a, a little more clear. Um, so then you're, you're gonna test this after you, you, know, you spin it down and separate it from the kind of the, um, the remains of the laced cells. Uh, and you're going to test the eluate against screening cells and A1 and B cells. Now, if a mother has a positive antibody screen, then um, it's usually best to just go ahead and perform an acid elution, um, like you're, you're probably already used to if you've done these in, in your clinical rotations. Um, th this is better for recovering um, all other types of antibodies. So anything that's not an A or B, uh, sorry, anti-A or anti-B or anti-A comma B antibody. It is possible to have both ABO and non-ABO antibodies bound to, neonatal, bound to the neonatal RBCs, and in those instances, uh, this type of evolution is also best. RH immune globulin, uh, which is often called RIG or um, ROGAM, which is the um, one of the predominant name brands, um, is administered to pregnant RHD negative women during pregnancy um, and at delivery if the neonate is RHD positive. I should also remark that it's only given um, if the mother doesn't, has not already alloimmunized against the D antigen. The, um, the mechanism of action isn't fully understood yet, um, but, but the idea is that the administered rig saturates all of the D antigen binding sites um, so that the, uh, the, the B cells, the memory B cells, never really become primed against them. Um, and that, that prevents the, the mother from ever making anti-D, basically tricking the body into thinking that it already has. Um, RIG may cause uh, anti-D to bind to neonatal cells because it is an IgG antibody, uh, and that'll create a, um, a weakly positive DAT in the cord blood, um, but it doesn't really cause any risk to the neonate during pregnancy or even after delivery. Uh, because the majority of neonatal antigenic exposure to the mother occurs after pregnancy, um, specifically during um, like a placental rupture um, eliciting a fetal maternal hemorrhage, um, multiple doses may end up being given within the uh, um, you know 72 hours of delivery. To determine if a fetal bleed has occurred in an RHD negative mother, uh, you're going to perform a fetal bleed screen, uh, which we're going to discuss on the following slide. And then if that test is positive, uh, the amount of vials uh, to be given must be calculated by estimating the amount of fetal blood present in the mother. And that's determined by performing a kleihauer betke test. The fetal bleed screen can only be used if the mother is truly RHD negative. If she's partial D and therefore um, is still a candidate for RIG, uh, then you should just go ahead and skip straight ahead to the kleihauer betke um, because the the fetal bleed screen is um, it's predicated on the anti-D reagent and that's going to potentially react with maternal cells as well. So we assume it would be falsely positive and just go ahead, or not necessarily falsely positive, we're going to assume that it's positive and just jump ahead to the, the kleihauer betke in those instances. Um, so to start, you add a drop of anti-D reagent to three test tubes, and then you, you add a drop of um, like a three to five percent maternal red blood cell suspension to one of the tubes and then you've got positive and negative controls that you're going to add to the other two tubes and you incubate these at room temperature um, and after your incubation period 
you wash away any unbound antibody. Um, and then after that, you're going to add RHD positive indicator cells. And these are going to bind to the other arm of the anti-D uh, that has bound to the, the patient's red blood cells, um, forming a rosette. So you can kind of see that in, in the top image, kind of a, a little cartoon where the, um, the indicator cells are binding to the anti-D that has already bound to the, the fetal RBCs. And then in the bottom right-hand corner, uh, it's not a great image, but this is kind of what those rosettes are going to look like under a microscope. Um, so uh, those rosettes, are, they're not large enough. You're not going to be able to detect them macroscopically in your agglutination viewer. Uh, you have to take these, have to take the tube to a bright field microscope um, and examine for rosettes. Um, if any of them are seen, then you transfer the specimen to a slide um, and then you, then you count them. Um, and if in five fields on that microscope, you see at least five rosettes, then the test is considered positive and a Kleinhauer-Bedke uh, test must be performed to quantitate the fetal bleed. The Kleinhauer-Bedke test is most often performed in hematology, uh, you know, in the hematology department in a, in a um, hospital laboratory, uh, since they already have a slide pre preparation area. Um, but occasionally they'll perform it in, in a hospital blood bank. It's just, it's not, not usually as convenient. Um, so to start, you make your blood smear using maternal whole blood. Um, you would also usually prepare controls, um, like your positive control. It's going to be, uh, you just add some cord blood, random, random cord blood to a male patient specimen. Um, and then you just use the, the male patient specimen with no cord blood added as your negative control. Um, after allowing the slides to dry, uh, you add an acid uh, sorry, an acid reagent, um, and this is only going to lyse the adult cells while the fetal cells um, resist acid elution. Um, after five minutes of exposure, you rinse off the acid reagent and add a buffering reagent, and that's usually left on for eight to ten minutes. Um, and then you immediately add uh, kind of a, a fuchsia counter stain, and that's taken up by the living fetal cells. Um, you can see the, the darker stained uh, cells here on the slide are the fetal cells and kind of the, the, the more pale ones, those are all adult cells. Um, now to figure out how much fetal blood is in the mother's circulation, we would normally need to count uh, 2,000 cells and then divide the fetal cells into the, the total number of cells counted for a percentage. There's, a, there's an easier way though and my slide got a little bit messed up here. You can kind of make out a, um, a white box with a, uh, a smaller box in the upper left-hand corner of it. Um, I originally colored those black, but I think when I switched it over to a darker mode, it, it must have changed those. Anyway, um, th this is what's known as a Miller disc. Um, it's, it's a basically a microscope ocular that has these, these boxes built in. They're usually a little easier to see. And um, the idea is that you count only the adult cells in the smaller box, but you count the fetal cells in, in the whole area, in the, in the larger box. Um, and that smaller box is supposed to be exactly one ninth of the, of the larger box. So if you count 222 total cells, then you've effectively counted around 2000 cells. Uh, once, you've, uh, once you have the percentage of fetal cells, uh, you can multiply by the maternal blood volume to determine the approximate amount of fetal blood that needs to be coated with RIG. Uh, RIG will cover about 30 milliliters of um, fetal cells, or at least fetal whole blood. Um, so we divide the fetal blood volume by 30, and then we round either up or down, and then add one more vial to the result. Um, this test has very, very poor reproducibility uh, and kind of compensate um, for that by always adding that extra vial, just in case. So you're pretty likely to have at least one uh, or only one uh, Kleinhauer-Bedke calculation on your board exam. Um, fortunately, the math is pretty easy, um, but you often have to make a couple of assumptions. Um, it's, a, it's a multiple choice test anyway, so you can usually just choose the answer that's closest to your calculation and, and not have too many problems. Uh, so let's say we counted 54 fetal cells in our total 2,000 fetal and adult cells. Uh, so we, we divide 
these, we, you know, we divide 54 into 2,000 um, to get a percentage of field bleed, which is the 2.7%. 2, 2 and then we take 2.7% of our estimated maternal blood volume, which is usually expressed as 5 liters or, um, or, or 5,000 microliters. Um, I'm sorry, milliliters. Occasionally, this value will be given to you. Um, otherwise, just, just kind of assume that the normal blood volume is, is 5,000 milliliters. It's, sometimes they give it to you. Sometimes uh, you, just have to, um, you just have to assume that this is what it is. Uh, so we end up with an um, estimated 135 milliliters of fetal blood, which is kind of a lot. Uh, if we divide this amount by 30, because each vial of rig covers 30 milliliters of fetal whole blood, then we get 4.5. We would round 4 point up to 5. Note that if that number was 4.4, we would round down instead. And then we're going to add one more vial for a total of six vials of rig. So you'll be looking for the, the answer that says six vials. If intrauterine transfusion is determined to be necessary uh, based either on uh, imaging techniques or cortisentesis, you know, draw, drawing some of the baby's blood and then testing it, uh, then donor RBCs can be injected straight into the umbilical vein. Uh, because fetal anemia is often diagnosed at a cut point of 10 grams per deciliter, that's also the, the standard therapeutic threshold. So they usually use 10 grams per deciliter if, if they're testing cor from cortisentesis, you know, they draw up some, uh, some baby sample and they test it on a, on a cell counter. Um, they'll determine uh, what, the, what the baby's hemoglobin is, and if it's less than 10 grams per deciliter, they wanna make sure it gets back over that, that threshold. And then for exchange transfusions, uh, the intent is to remove any unconjugated bilirubin. And remember that that's after delivery. We do exchange transfusions after delivery, intrauterine transfusions is, is during the pregnancy. Um, it's rare to do exchange transfusions, though, because uh, phototherapy is, is kind of the primary course of treatment after after delivery. If a, if a fetus has, uh, or sorry, if a, if a neonate has HDFN, um, it's usually only implicated if the neonate's indirect bilirubin is above 18 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, in an exchange transfusion, we give whole blood, um, or sorry, we, we take whole blood out of the neonate. Uh, you remove it out in small amounts, you can't just take all of it out and then replace it. So you're, you're pulling out some of the neonate's blood um, and along with it, some of that bilirubin and some of the, uh, um, the circulating maternal antibody and sometimes even in some of the sensitized cells. Um, and then we're gonna replace it with prepared whole blood. Uh, and that consists of group O RBCs that are reconstituted to a hematocrit that's um, determined by the physician um, using AB plasma. This, pla this uh, process also kind of helps remove, um, uh, oh, I already mentioned that, some of the uh, unbound maternal antibody and some of the sensitized RBCs. In general, uh, blood for intrauterine and neonatal transfusions should be group O, RHD negative, unless determined otherwise, you know, if, if they have a rare type and they need to be antigen negative or something else, it can be tricky to get RHD negative, but the goal is typically group O RHD negative. Uh, CMV negative to prevent possible transmission of cytomegalovirus. It should be irradiated to prevent graft versus host disease. And then it should be hemoglobin S negative and fresh, as in less than seven days old, to, um, to kind of ensure the best possible oxygen delivery. You know, if, if, if we have a sickle cell donor um, and they're in a kind of a hypoxic environment, uh, those those cells will not carry oxygen as well, and then we also have the um, I'm not sure if, if we've uh, gone over this yet, but storage lesion is, is a phenomenon where, as products age, the, as blood products age, uh, they lose some of like their two three DPG, and uh, uh, they kind of gain oxygen affinity, and they're they're they kind of hold on to the oxygen a little too much, and they don't release it to the tissues. We don't want that in in these babies. We want um, well oxygenated blood to be um, circulating. Uh, and then we also want the units to be antigen negative for whatever antibody or antibodies the mother has. All right, uh, that's it for 
the new information, I'm, we're just going to kind of review a, a little bit here because it's, it's kind of a lot of information to hit you with at once. Um, th this is how I kind of like to break down perinatal testing. It's, it's three, uh, three different categories or, or arms. Um, so you can kind of break them down by remembering that the initial testing performed on a pregnant woman is a type and screen. So type and screen consists of three parts and each of those correspond to one of these arms. So the first arm comes from the ABO. If there's a serological ABO incompatibility between the mother and the fetus, then we can reasonably expect a mild HDFN. Uh, keep in mind that because a larger percentage of ABO antibodies um, in group uh, O mothers are IgG, that the group O mothers tend to be the ones uh, with more instances of, of HDFN of, of, their, of their babies. Um, some amount of anti-A will be IgG, um, although most of it's IgM, and kind of the same with anti-B, uh, but anti-A comma B tends to be predominantly IgG. So if we test cord cells and find that the baby is not group O and has a positive DAT, and we know that the mother doesn't have a positive antibody screen, you know, she has a negative screen, no, no other antibodies, um, then we're going to perform a Louis Freestyle elution to confirm that these antibodies that are bound to the cord cells are ABO antibodies and not something else like a, uh, we could have an antibody to a, a low frequency antigen, like an anti-KPA or something like that, that we wouldn't have picked up in the maternal screen. Um, so this is the best way of verifying that those antibodies definitely are um, either anti-A or anti-B or, or more, most likely anti-A comma B. Um, and then the next arm is based on the RHD test of the, of the type and screen. Um, specifically, when we have a uh, RHD negative mother who receives ROGAM at, uh, or sorry, RAG at 28 weeks gestation, kind of irrespective of the fetal blood type, um, and also as long as the mother doesn't already have allo anti D. And then when the mother gives birth to an RHD positive neonate, then we need to assess whether a fetal bleed is present because if so, um, she could autoimmunize against that D antigen. It, it could overcome the rig that's already in her system. So we want to give more to protect against that. Um, just keep in mind that HGFN from anti D is the most lethal. Uh, so we try as, as much as we can to prevent that, uh, prevent autoimmunization. So if, if a bleed is present, uh, then we need to quantitate the bleed with the Cly Howard Bedke test. And that's going to help us determine how much additional rig needs to be given to prevent allergy immunization. And then the third arm is based on the that initial maternal antibody screen. So remember, we have a type and screen is ABORH, sorry, ABO, RH, and antibody screen. So this is the third arm, the antibody screen. Um, so if the antibody screen was positive and we identified a clinically significant antibody, uh, then we'd be concerned that that antibody might cause HDFN, just like the, the D, um, anti-D anti causes HDFN in, in the same way. It's, it's a subsequent pregnancy that's affected, um, and it's, it's never as severe as, as D. It's somewhere in between the ABO and the, and the D. Um, I'd say big K is probably the next most lethal. Um, that one usually causes some, some pretty serious anemia issues and, and often requires exchange transfusion. Um, I'm sorry, not exchange transfusion, intrauterine transfusion. Um, there, there are a few others that are pretty serious, but th those are the big ones. Um, the the anti-D and anti-K. I've, I've seen some anti-S's that didn't go so well and some anti-big C's that didn't go very well, um, but they're, you know, they were all treated and, and babies are fine. Um, anyway, off topic. Uh, so if you know, once we once we determine the identity of this antibody, um, we we don't really have a a great way of determining whether the baby has the antigen. We could do like the the testing on the father that I mentioned before, um, but more commonly these days uh, we're we're titering the antibody or we're using imaging techniques. So if, if we titer that antibody, um, we see if it increases in strength after about four weeks or so, uh, which would indicate exposure to the antigen. And that would mean that the fetus, the fetus would have to express it in order for there to be expo exposure. Uh, or we could just use one of those imaging techniques like the ultrasound or the uh, or Doppler 
of the, um, the, the middle cerebral artery peak systolic velocity. Um, a lot of the time those, those imaging techniques are just reserved for pregnancies after the first baby has been affected by HDFN. Uh, so if, if the mother has history of babies having HDFN due to their, their antibody, then they'll employ those, those imaging techniques a little, a little more regular, uh, readily. Um, and then, so once the baby is born, and if the DAT is positive, then we're also going to perform an acid elution to verify the causative antibody. All right, so just keep these straight. You've got three different arms, three things that you're worried about with perinatal testing. And that's it for this presentation. Uh, we're just going to go back over these objectives. Uh, just make sure you kind of have these down. Um, if you want to review them first, you know, pause the lecture, think about them a little bit, and then I'm, I'm going to discuss them here for just to make sure that we, we hit all the, the keynotes here. Um, so remember that uh, HGFN, or hemolytic disease of the fetus and newborn, uh, occurs when a mother who was previously exposed to a red blood cell antigen, um, either by transfusion or pregnancy, uh, now has a baby inside of her that expresses that same antigen. Um, her antibodies to cross the placenta and lysed fetal cells, leading to anemia and then sometimes worse consequences. Um, so like after delivery, we're concerned about that, that buildup of unconjugated bilirubin uh, and, and that could lead to chronicteris, which is um, permanent brain damage. Um, so your, your role as a medical technologist is to perform all the tests that we mentioned in this presentation. You've got the initial type and screen of the mother, along with antibody ID and titration as necessary. Uh, after the neonate is born, uh, you'll be able to perform a, a forward ABO and, R, and sorry, ABORH, and then also the DAT. If the DAT is positive, then you can perform an elution. You'll either do the Louis freeze thaw um, or acid elution, depending on the status of the mother um, and, and the cord blood type. Uh, and then, of course, the um, if the mother is RHD negative and the cord blood is RHD positive, uh, you're going to perform a fetal bleed screen. If that's positive, then um, you're likely to perform a Kleinhauer Betke test. Uh, I didn't mention this earlier, but Kleinhauer Betke tests are also used sometimes um, in cases of car accidents if, if a mother who is RHD positive, so we, we have no way of assessing fetal bleed. Um, we, we can determine if there's a bleed just by performing Kleihar Becky on maternal sample, um, whether whether the mother's um, uh, D positive or not. Um, however, the, the, there's a little bit of an interference if the mother has uh, um, sickle cell anemia or um, hemoglobin, uh, what is it, hemoglobin C crystals. Uh, if, if they have either of those, those are also resistant to the acid elution, so uh, the, the results kind of look a little bit weird. Uh, so for the next objective, compare and contrast ABO and RH and HGFN. Um, remember that ABO, HGFN is usually mild, it can be treated with phototherapy, um, but it is not preventable. While RH, HGFN is much more severe and may need more drastic measures for treatment, like either a intrauterine transfusion or maybe an exchange transfusion after delivery. Um, however, RH HDFN is preventable as long as the mother has never been exposed to the D antigen. And then of course, uh, we're not comparing these here, but we have HDFN due to um, any other clinically significant aloe antibody. Uh, all of those IgG ones are perfectly capable of crossing the placenta and potentially binding to fetal cells uh, and then ca causing um, uh, cell lysis and, and uh, and hemolytic disease. Um, and then speaking of the D antigen, uh, this kind of falls under the next objective. Um, RIG should be given to pregnant women who are RHD negative and do not already have allo anti-D. RIG can't protect you if you've already developed the antibody and that's the, that's the whole function, to prevent the mother from developing anti-D if she's exposed to D-positive fetal cells during pregnancy or after delivery. Uh, it's also occasionally used um, if, if we're transducing D-positive pooled platelets to uh, D-negative women of childbearing years, um, if in those pooled platelets there's, there's a visible amount of blood in the unit. And then next we have, um, oh, we had two tests for detecting and quantifying fetal maternal hemorrhage. Hopefully you remember these. Um, there was the fetal bleed screen, or the, the rosette test as it's sometimes known, or sometimes called. Um, 
where you add the anti-D to your patient's RBCs to see if there's any RHD positive cord cells present. Um, you have to wash away that anti-D and then add uh, some D positive indicator cells and those form microscopic rosettes around the, uh, the cord cells, the RHD positive cord cells. And then we also had the, uh, the Kleihauer Becky test, uh, which we, that, that one used the acid elution to lyse adult cells, and then we had the counter stain. Um, well, there's, there's a buffer, in between, buffer step in between, uh, but we had the counter stain, and that is taken up by the still living fetal cells. Um, and then we, we, count, we, count, <laughs> we count the fetal cells and the adult cells, 2,000 sometimes, or we use that Miller disk. And after that, you can kind of determine how many vials of, of rig to provide. You know, you re rehearse those calculations. You, you want to go back over that, um, you know, the, the stepwise function of calculating the fetal bleed percentage and then determining how many, how many vials. Don't forget to round up or down and then add one. And then for the next objective, the, the blood products for intrauterine transfusion uh, and exchange transfusion uh, must be O negative. Well, we, we shoot for O negative anyway. Uh, they have to be hemoglobin S negative, CMV negative, irradiated, and less than seven days old. Uh, units for exchange transfusion um, are, are then usually uh, reconstituted in AB plasma. And that should be all you need to know. Um, there's, there's always plenty more to learn, uh, but please reach out if you have any questions, and good luck on your quiz.